I think that today, any investor looking to invest in multifamily should not be buying a property, should not be investing into a property. They should be investing into a rescue fund. It's a clearly superior opportunity with superior short-term and superior long-term returns and a significant reduction of risk compared to going into a property today. Hello and welcome to episode 380. I'm thrilled to have Neil Bawa back on the show today. Neil is a data scientist and technologist who always has his finger on the pulse of the economy and the state of commercial real estate investing. Neil is also a top-rated and in-demand presenter at conferences and events across the country, and he's a successful investor with over $1 billion in assets under management. He's also the CEO of Grow Capitus and Multifamily University. Neil is known universally as the mad scientist of multifamily, and I always pay attention to what Neil has to say because he's incredibly well-informed and always entertaining. Neil, welcome back to the show. Well, thanks for having me back on, Brian. So much has changed since the last time you spoke. I think we spoke just after COVID happened and you you brought so much information and data then, and I'm sure I've had you back since then. But I love hearing what you have to say, and the timing couldn't be better because we've just had these bank failures. You know, interest rates are are super high and going higher. Looking forward to you helping us put all of this in context and just kind of sharing what you see happening and what you anticipate happening. I think what has happened is a fundamental shift, right? For the last nine months that the Federal Reserve has been raising interest rates, everyone that I know of in the general economy, economists, you know, big fund managers have been saying that the Fed will break something. And I expected that the Fed would break something, you know, in Q3 last year when it was raising at 0.75% basically every month, which was a very, very high pace. I then expected them to break something in December and didn't, you know, happen for a while. And I was like, internally, the Fed must be gloating about the fact that they're able to raise rates and not really break anything in the economy. You know, the, the stock market was reasonably priced, went down a bit, but wasn't horrible. There was no, you know, challenges there that I can I can imagine. Commercial real estate went down in, in pricing, so significant price drop there, single family price drops, but not no crises in any of these areas. And then all of that thought process that the Fed hasn't broken anything yet, so it can continue to raise faster, came to an abrupt halt about you know 17 or 18 days ago when Silicon Valley Bank failed. So as a result of that, the curve that we expected of uh, you know, how much longer will the Fed raise rates? How long will they keep them there? And then what will be the decline rate? That curve has changed very dramatically because I was expecting, let's call it one day before Silicon Valley Bank's failure, because inflation was staying high, because the economy was doing well, because we were generating an astonishing number of jobs in January and February, I was expecting that the Fed would take the Fed funds rate, which stands at 5% today, by the way, they did rate it, raise it by a quarter, even after Silicon Valley Bank's failure, and we'll talk about why they had to do that. So it's set five, and I was expecting the curve to go up it right around 5.75, and then steady there for a while, maybe four or five months, and then start a slow decline backwards. Today, my expectation is that from five, the Fed will only do a 5.25, and that'll happen in May. There's no Mar- April meeting for the Fed And then they'll hold, but this time they won't hold for four or five months. I think they'll just hold for a couple months and then they'll start a sharper decline in interest rates. So by the end of the year, you could actually have rates lower than they are today, right? So they're, even though they're going up, the rates should be lower by the end of the year. And when I say rates, I still mean the Fed funds rate. Mortgage rates almost unquestionably will be lower because mortgage rates while they're based on the Fed funds rate, are a prediction of what the Fed is going to do in the future. So they tend to drop before the Fed actually drops interest rates, right? So now when the Fed will start to drop interest rates, let's call it in October or November, it's giving them a signal for further future drops. And so they'll keep that in mind. So we should have a significantly lower mortgage rate, both for commercial assets and single family in the coming you know, seven or eight months. So the first thing that's changed because of the bank crisis is this interest rate expected forward-looking curve. There's a lot of bad things that are going to happen because of this crisis, but but that's the first effect that I've seen, the interest rate curve changing. Let me dig into that a little bit more with you because 
Are you referring to like the expectations you're seeing in the market that it'll go up another 0.25 and then start coming back down? And, or are you basing that on, well, the Fed doesn't want to put any more banks out of business? Because at the end of the day, aren't they really trying to get inflation back down? And, and are we really seeing any of that relief there when it comes to inflation? Inflation is actually a self-fulfilling prophecy for the most part. Before we continue, let me take 60 seconds to tell you about Multifamily University. Are you ready to take your real estate investing to the next level? Look no further than Multifamily University. Our comprehensive resources, including guest podcast appearances, educational webinars, the Real Estate Trends Toolkit, and the Location Magic course are all designed to make smart investing easy and accessible. Plus, with no subscriptions, no upsells, you can trust that we're always looking out for your best interests. But don't take our word for it. Check out what our satisfied customer, Carlos M., had to say. Neil's presentation was filled with invaluable information that is not readily available to the average investor. This group takes you to the elite level of investing. Join the ranks of the elite with Multifamily University. Join us at multifamilyu.com and start investing from a place of knowledge today. Not only will you have access to a wealth of knowledge from industry experts, but you'll also be able to stay ahead of the game with our in-depth analysis of market trends and potential recessions or corrections. Invest with confidence and make informed decisions based on data, not gut feel. Don't miss out. Visit us at multifamilyu.com today or click the link in the description below. And now back to the content. What was very clear to the market in January and February was that the U.S. economy was doing wonderfully well. I expect us to, our GDP for Q1 to grow at over 3% on an annualized rate, which is pretty fantastic, by the way. And I expect, you know, our unemployment in terms of job creation to be basically a million jobs for the quarter. A million jobs is just party time because we, the U.S. economy typically creates 2 million in a year. So to create a million in a quarter is wow. Right. So given all of that, inflation itself was moving up because people were expecting that, you know, they'd have to keep hiring employees and the economy would do well. And so they need more employees. Their output would grow. Their deposits would grow, whatever it is. So every business's expectation is positive and that fulfills inflation that creates inflation in the economy. But because of what happened in the last 20 days, every CEO now is bearish, especially financial CEOs, so bank CEOs and every kind of financial product CEOs are extremely bearish. But in general, you know, CEOs are bearish. So even the com- companies that were doing really well are cutting jobs, like Accenture, 19,000 jobs. And that came in after the crisis. Amazon, 10,000 new job cuts. That came in after the crisis. So just one after the other, companies are saying, you know what? I wasn't sure whether we were going to go into a recession. And because labor is so hard to find, I was going to hold on to it. But this dam has now broken 20 days ago where CEOs are saying, we're going to go into a recession. I need to adjust my labor. And labor was costing most of the was causing most of the inflation the last three months. So if you look at inflation over the last 12 months, there was in the early months of this process, supply chains were causing a lot of our uh, inflation. Well, they have definitely moderated tremendously. I'd say 95% of supply chain issues at this point are resolved and we're moving towards 100. So most inflation today in the last three months, last four months, if you look at inflation, the the root cause is labor. Labor's expensive, labor's hard to find, salaries are up, and that's causing inflation because energy is also moderated. So we had oil at $120 a barrel five, six months ago. And today oil is, let's see, $73.18. So that's a very reasonable price for oil. So oil isn't causing much inflation at this point in time. So it's really the labor market. And so now, Brian, you have this situation where 100,000 CEOs have, have switched their mind from maybe recession to, oh, definitely recession. And that reduces inflation because they're hiring less people. And because they're hiring less people, they, have, they don't have to pay up as much. So the curve of inflation itself is going to bend now not just the expectations of inflation. Both of those things are going to happen at the same time. And then the third thing, which is very important, is the Fed now knows the risk that they are creating. In in their mind, this risk that they were basically putting banks out of business was theoretical in nature. A few economists had discussed it in boring white papers that no one had read. 
Now, of course, everyone thinks that they're a genius in saying, I told you so that you'd, you'd break something. And what's interesting is the Fed was OK with breaking parts of the economy that are not related to the banking system, because most people think that you know, the Fed's primary job is to con control inflation. No, it's not. 90 percent of Fed employees, they work on things related to the banking system. 10% of them work on things related to inflation, maybe not even 10%, right? So because the Fed is a banking regulator. So what they broke was not something in real estate or something in the tech market or something in the insurance industry. They broke something in their backyard. They broke something in the banking system. And that makes it extremely difficult for the Fed to keep raising rates, regardless of what happens to inflation. But my argument isn't that the Fed will not raise despite inflation. My argument is that you're going to see a significant reduction in inflation because of how devastating the Fed's you know, damage is to the banking system. And we can talk more about that. The, the, the challenge is you cannot have growth. You cannot have significant growth when you're going into a liquidity crunch. And there's almost a 100% guarantee that the next 12 months are a liquidity crunch. Let's talk about that liquidity crunch because you talk about the Fed breaking things. They didn't really anticipate breaking the banks so quickly and abruptly, but yet that happened. Now in the commercial real estate world, you know, I'm interested to know what, what you think is breaking and is that liquidity crunch part of it? I'll start with a quote from the most famous man on earth. I think he's the most famous man on earth. So yesterday, Elon Musk tweeted that the greatest risk to our system today is in commercial real estate. And I think I have to agree, it's not the banks because the Fed has extraordinary programs that they've created in the last 12 days to buffer up the banking system. So they've done a lot. I, I have to say they, they move very quickly, they move very aggressively to shore up the banking system. And so while I expect more banks to fail, banks fail all the time. Right. I do not expect a systemic bank to fail, which now I'm going to not define as, you know, a trillion dollars or more in deposit. I have a new definition of systemically important banks after looking at Silicon Valley Bank, which was 200 billion. Basically, banks over 100 billion. I don't think we're going to see a lot of failures. A 30 billion dollar bank, 20 billion dollar bank. These are very small numbers. They'll fail. They fail all the time. Big deal. I think the banking system is now fairly resilient because of the work that the Fed has done. I think what's not resilient is commercial real estate. Because what has happened here is that a line has been drawn between systemically important banks, you know, the Chases, the Wells Fargo's Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, Schwab's of the world, and the regional banks. So a typical regional bank might be 50 billion, 100 billion, 200 billion in deposits, maybe going up to three or 400 billion. Well, the regional banks have seen a tremendous flight of deposits, including me. I moved my money from a regional bank into a big bank. And then I spread it out in $250,000 chunks, chunks through that bank. But bottom line is a lot of people moved money from regional banks, such as First Republic Bank, a bank that's still struggling, and moved it up to Chase or you know Wells Fargo. When they did that, their ability to lend declined massively, massively. So a bank that had $200 billion in deposits maybe could lend out $400 billion. Well, now all of a sudden they have $150 billion in deposit. They can only lend out $300 billion. Also, they were doing a bunch of things that were gray shade, like they had internal benchmarks and all of them were exceeding those benchmarks, right? Even though they're not supposed to do that because they wrote those benchmarks themselves. Well, as you know, the Fed heavily regulates the systemic banks. So the systemic banks have to prove that they're following all of their internal benchmarks and they have to do it once a quarter. Well, the smaller banks, the Fed doesn't force you to do that. They basically just say, write your own methodologies and follow them. Well, now the Fed's saying, no, 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 I'm going to come check on you. I'm going to come check on you. So now that the, the, these mid-level banks have taken two hits, the first hit is they have less deposits so they can lend out less money. The second one is they now have to follow their internal systems that which they were flouting. Silicon Valley Bank was clearly flouting its internal systems and, and safeguards. So now if they follow those, now they've taken a double hit. So I think that the the regional banks lend out half the money that they were lending out before. And guess who is the most important lender to commercial real estate? Regional banks. It's the smaller banks that lend the money that we use to build or buy commercial real estate. So commercial real estate is going to be affected. And that's why Elon thinks, hey, this is the biggest risk right now. Commercial real estate could melt down. 
and we could melt down. I think that we, there's a significant risk here that we have to manage over the next seven or eight months. On the good side, interest rates coming down quicker mean that things are better for commercial real estate. So we have to manage our liquidity in the next 12 months, but now we may not have to manage it for the next 18. We might only have to manage it for the next 12. So the time frame's gotten shorter, but our problems have been accelerated by what happened with the banking failures in the last 18 days. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Can you walk us through where you see the danger and things getting broken in commercial real estate, given that there's this liquidity crunch? Like, What does that mean In the real world, what will we be seeing here over the next 12 months? So I'll break it into three pieces. Firstly, single family real estate. It means nothing. I I think single family real estate is in an incredibly good place simply because almost everything that anyone has purchased has a 3% or 2% interest rate and it's a 30 year fixed. People are fine. They're not transacting. Volume's down more than 80%. I think single family real estate will do well. Now, commercial real estate, I'm going to break it up into two pieces, right? So there's the the existing commercial real estate, and then the one has to be built, right? So I'll go with the one that has to be built. Well, everything that has to be built might screech to a halt, right? You might not be able to find financing to build this multifamily that you're building or this office building or retail or whatever it is, right? The multifamily is probably going to be the least affected because it's the most favored asset class in commercial real estate at this point. Office is going to be the most affected because it's the least favored, right? So you're going to see a significant number of projects grind to a halt. Now, the first impact on that uh, on pricing is land. The moment you can't build, land becomes worthless. Land has no value at that point in time. Land just becomes so we've seen land prices triple over the last five years, four or five years. Now all of a sudden that's going to reverse, and now people are like. Look, I, I can't, you know, I can't get loans to build anything. I'm not buying your land. I can't even get a a, a, a loan to buy your land. Normally, you can get you know, a year and a half ago, Brian. I was getting 65 to 70 percent leverage on just raw land, not even zone, raw land. Banks were willing to do that. I bet you nobody gives me even 50 percent today, maybe 40. Right. So if I can't even get leverage on land, well, what are my chances that I'll I'll go through the process of getting it zoned and blah, 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 and then get a a big loan? So on the new construction side, you're going to see an abrupt slowdown. A very it was already there, by the way, that there's already been a 30, 40 percent slowdown, but you could easily see a 50, 60 percent slowdown. And the biggest impact on that is definitely going to be on the land side. So you could see very, very significant and quick, you know, declines in the price of land. On the value add side, normally I would have said, well, it's not such a big deal because they can simply wait for 12 months for conditions to get better. Unfortunately, the timing is pretty awful. And I'll explain why. So the first two quarters of 2020 were basically COVID. We couldn't really buy properties because we couldn't go during COVID to check them out. And, you know, everything was closed and cities were closed. So a lot of transactions that were supposed to happen in Q1 and Q2 of 2020 got pushed into Q3 and Q4 of 2020. So there was a pretty heavy volume there. And then, of course, 2021 was an insane amount of volume. 
Now, imagine that you're closing on a property in Q3 2020 and you get a bridge loan. And that bridge loan is a two-year loan, so it, it, it renews sometime in Q3 in the third quarter of 2022. You have an extension, so that's fine. You execute your extension last year, and that extension is going to end in Q3 of this year, 2023. And now, technically, you have more extensions. But did you know that banks are not required to allow you, banks are not required to trigger an extension if the property value falls? So if the value of the property falls, then the bank can say, I'm not going to trigger an extension. These, this extension had some assumptions, and one of those assumptions, the value is no longer true. So values in the, these buildings that have been purchased in the last two or three years have fallen by an average of 17 or 18%, and it's accelerating. So by July, they would have fallen by a value of 25%. So now you have thousands and thousands of properties that are coming up for renewals in Q3 and Q4 of this year, and the banks are going to not absolutely refuse to renew them. They know that there's enough equity in these properties that the banks are not going to lose money. Well, if the banks feel like they're not going to lose money, they don't care about all the money that's invested in the property, all the equity. It's not their concern. They're just going to say, I don't want to renew this. You, you figure out how to renew this. You go find a different lender, blah, blah, blah. Or if you want me to renew it, add another $5 million of liquidity. So just come in, give me a $5 million check, and then I'll give you your extension, right? This is going to happen to thousands and thousands of properties all across the United States. And I think the vast majority of these properties cannot be refinanced. So on the new construction side, land val values will plummet. Developers will have trouble finding cash to build their buildings. On the value add side, these thousands and thousands of highly overpriced properties that now are worth 18% less by July, probably 25% less. Who's going to refinance them? That's a lot of distress there. What do you see happening? I mean, is there opportunity there? First of all, it's sad that a lot of people are, who invested in these properties are going to be distressed and you know, lose some money. But what are the opportunities that, that might arise from that? The first opportunity is what is known as rescue funds, right? So I'm launching one. I'm likely to work with a Wall Street you know, source for that fund. There are other people launching them as well. So I think that rescue funds will do one of two things. They'll give money to properties to continue to bleed. Remember, a lot of these properties are bleeding. Why? Because their interest rates are up to 8%, 8.5%. Even if they had rate caps, those rate caps were at 8%. Those rate caps were at 9%. So even if you've hit your rate cap, you still have to pay the first 8 or 9%. And that means that your property is likely to be bleeding. So not all of them are bleeding, but a, a, a very significant portion, not talking about 5 or 10%, could be a third or maybe 40% of these properties are bleeding. So if a rescue fund could come in and pay for that bleed for the next year, year and a half, that's one way of rescuing these properties. It's not good news for the existing investors because they are the ones that get, you know, basically they get devalued or in certain cases, they lose 100% of the cash flow for this property, but it's better than losing your equity. The second way is that rescue funds come in and they basically refinance you to 10-year debt, to fixed debt. But on the day of refinance, they probably have to add in five or six million dollars into the property so that it qualifies for that debt. Because of debt coverage ratios, debt to income ratios, very often these properties, when you go to Fannie Freddie and say, hey, I want to get a 10-year fixed loan, Fannie Freddie says, yeah, but I'll only give you a loan for 36 million. And what you really need is $42 million. And so now $6 million, where does that come from? Well, it usually comes from a rescue fund. So once again, the rescue fund comes in. They take a position ahead of the existing investors. They sweep all of the cash flow. They have basically first dibs. And so that's really the opportunity. And, and funds are being created for that purpose. I think that today, any investor looking to invest in multifamily should not be buying a property, should not be investing into a property. They should be investing into a rescue fund. It's a clearly superior opportunity with superior short-term and superior long-term returns and a significant reduction of risk compared to going into a property today. The properties that are in trouble are properties that were acquired more recently with, with bridge loans as opposed to properties that may have long-term fixed debt. I think very few properties that have long-term fixed debt are in trouble, but keep in mind that the syndication industry, which is not the entire multifamily industry, we're, we're a small portion of the overall multifamily industry. The syndication industry in the last three years has overwhelmingly used bridge debt, maybe not in the last six months, but before that, 
the vast majority of these properties, I'm not talking about 2023 properties. There's nothing wrong with 2023 properties. Some of them were already discounted. Some of them already have fixed debt. And some of them, if they have bridge debt, well, then bridge debt's really going to reset in 2025. So good for them. So it's really properties that were purchased in the second half of 2020, first half of all of 2021, and maybe the first half of 2022 that are at the greatest risk. But anything purchased in 2020 and 2021, I think, is where 80% of the risk lies. And of course, these were properties that were, for the most part, 90 plus percent of them were purchased with floating debt. Going back to construction, new apartment construction, I know, Neil, that you're doing new apartment construction. I'm doing a new apartment construction. The factors are overwhelming and, 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 you know, those headwinds as far as like preventing that from happening. And I think you did a good job of, of explaining why. But what do we do? Do we just sit and wait or, or what's going to break before we can start building again? What we are doing is, you know, luckily some of our construction loans are fixed and they're locked in. So good for us. We have a few that are floating. And so we're raising some extra capital for those or putting money in from our own pockets to, you know, keep those going. For the ones where I was at shovel ready, I have made a hard stop. And I'm going back to my architects and saying, I want you to downspec the project and cut my budget by 10%. 10% is a lot because, you know, if my average construction budget is $50 million, I'm saying, save me $5 million, figure it out, right? And my architects who are very experienced are doing that. Then I'm going back to my builders with this new spec and saying, I need you to save me 20%. 10% of that is going to get saved from the down specking. So it doesn't come out of the builder's pocket. But the remaining 10% is basically renegotiation with subs and figuring these sorts of things out. Until about 60 days ago, the subs were like, no, I I don't think we can save you 20%. Now they're like, absolutely, we can. Why? Because the, the builders are now coming to the end of their contracts. Over the last year, the builders have had plenty of work because their contracts were from the year before when things were awesome. Over the last year, the contract started to diminish. And over the last three months, they've diminished very radically. So construction industry has started to lay off people. There were no layoffs in the construction industry last year. There, were, there was a lot of hiring. This year, there are layoffs. So if you look at a January or late January headline, it talks about serious construction industry layoffs. So it's beginning to happen. And at this point in time, we're renegotiating prices. We're, I, the other thing that we're doing is we're phasing our projects. So if I had a 300 unit project, it's now a 150 unit project with another 150 units being made a year later. So my construction loan, we basically remember my $50 million loan, I get a 20% cut on that, it becomes 40 million. Now I'm phasing it, so now it becomes half, not maybe not quite half, because I still have to do some pieces for the whole project, like building the amenity center. So now instead of $40 million, it's a $24 million project. So from 50 to 24 is less than half of the money needed at this point of time. Eventually more will be needed. So by by making those very aggressive in your face changes, we're able to bring down the amount of debt that is needed to a much more reasonable level for the, for our projects. So it's a lot of work. We've, we've been doing it for months and finally it's bearing fruit. So I, I'm feeling good about it. What other opportunities do you see in the market right now? I mean, you talked about doing a, a rescue fund What else are you thinking of doing to take advantage of this window of opportunity that we might have? I am going out to people that bought land and offering them a LP position in my new construction project. So let's say Brian had land that he bought for $4 million and it's gone up to $6 million and now it's going down. So it's it's gone down to maybe 5 million. It hasn't all gone down all the way to four. So Brian's got some equity in it. So, but Brian knows he can't sell the project right now because simply because nobody wants to buy land, right? So I basically tell uh, Brian, okay, how about this? I don't have the ability to buy your land for $5 million. I don't want to give you a single dollar. I will, you can come into my project and I'll give you $5 million of equity, equity in the project as a limited partner. And you give me your land. So now I don't have to raise $5 million. And you get to lock in the value of this land at $5 million, even though you know that the value of the land is declining. Does that make sense? So now I've resolved my limited partner equity issue. They've resolved their issue of their land continuously falling in value. And they also have the option of making some more money on the land in the future. Because now that $5 million worth of land, 
you know, if I sell in 2026, my property at double the price, well, they are going to make $10 million. Now, this pitch a year ago had zero value. People would laugh at you. Today, it's like, oh, this is a great idea. Let's work on it together. Are you doing that to tie up the land so you can develop it? Or is this a land play for you? To, to, to develop it, because obviously it wouldn't be value for them if I wasn't going to develop it, right? Because if I just basically said, I'll take your land and do nothing with it, they're going to be like, well, then why should I give it to you, right? I'll keep it. So I think it, it only works if you're developing, but think about it this way. It resolves multiple problems, right? One is I need to raise $5 million less in LP equity, right? And then it, it prevents the land value from crashing as more and more developers do this. I'm sure, Brian, right now, thousands of developers are doing this. This is not a, you know, created by Neil Bauer idea. And that prevents the land values from crashing. And that basically keeps commercial real estate afloat. We, we have to do whatever we need to do, rescue funds, land swaps, things like that to prevent vol vol volumes from falling too much. Because the problem is volumes fall, you know, values fall 15, 20%. It's not such a big deal. They fall 30%. The banks start writing them down. Then there's no financing available, right? And we're getting there. So it's a, it's a time to be very careful. What would you advise our listeners and our viewers on YouTube to avoid and not do over the next year? Don't do business as usual. Don't assume that cap rates will come back. I don't think that, you know, cap rates have increased. So, you know, if cap rates were four cap, now they're five and a quarter. So they've gone up by 125 basis points. And if it's a class C building, they've gone up by 150 to 175 basis points. There is an as assumption, an inherent assumption that if a year from now, interest rates are lower, then cap rates will bounce back to where they were before. That the first assumption is a reasonable one. The second assumption is nonsensical in nature. It'll take, in my mind, three years now. The damage that has been done to cap rates is very extensive. It'll take three years for cap rates to get back to reasonable levels. And I think they will never get back to 2021 levels. 2021 was a crazy year. We flooded the market with $3 trillion of liquidity. The cap rates that we saw in 2021 are unlikely to ever be seen again. But the cap rates that we saw in 2018 or 2019, we can get back to those cap rates. But I think it takes much longer than most people think. So what's your timeline? Where do you see us a year from now, two years from now, and, and say three years from now, as far as interest rates, cap rates, the, the market in general? So this is not a recovery year. So there was this thinking uh, six months ago that 2022 is a tough year because of interest rates and 2023 is a recovery year. That's simply not true. 2022 was a tough year. 2023 is a tougher year. 2024 is a recovery year. And 2025 is a values going up, you know, significant forward momentum, you know, animal spirits returning to the marketplace. So basically, the mantra of the market of the multifamily industry should be survive to 2025. Survive to 2025. Tell us what is your favorite hack or app? My favorite hack is a app called Zapier. Most people don't know what Zapier is, but imagine you had a person that spoke 200 languages. So it, you know, it could translate between English and German and German and Spanish. It could do that all day long. Zapier allows my 100 plus software stack to talk with each other without me writing a line of code. It is basically a software to software translator. This allows me to move information in, in real time, high speed between all of my different software. And that makes an incredible difference, a shocking difference to our productivity. The second one, of course, is ChatGPT, but I would encourage you to understand that ChatGPT is not very powerful. It is platforms built on ChatGPT that are absolutely incredible. For example, look at adept, A-D-E-P-T dot A-I. Adept dot A-I is a ChatGPT platform application where ChatGPT answers questions. Adept does things like putting an incoming contact into Salesforce or booking your ticket on Kayak, things like that. It does things. It's still using ChatGPT's technology and capabilities, but it's now taking it to the next level. So any ChatGPT platform application right now 
is amazing. Are, are you pretty bullish on the, the AI and how it's going to interface with real estate? Artificial intelligence is the greatest revolution in mankind's history. Greater than the wheel, greater than the smartphone, greater than the internet, and greater than the graphical user interface. Nothing that we have done in our history is as powerful or as dangerous as artificial intelligence. Powerful answer there. Neil, how would people find out more about you and or get a hold of you? I happen to be the only Neil Bawa on the World Wide Web. So simply type in N-E-A-L space B-A-W-A and hit enter into Google. So the first 5,000 articles that come up are all, all about me. There's about 200 podcasts stored on podchaser.com. So podchaser.com. Just type in Neil Bawa into the search and you'll see a couple hundred of them. Also, for those that want access to our data library. So we do 12 webinars a year that are extremely in-depth webinars, massive amounts of data, 50 plus slides of very, very key actionable data. All of that is stored at Multifamily University, which is multifamily followed by the letter U.com, multifamilyu.com. I love your webinars. You do fantastic webinars. They're the best out there. I highly recommend that people watching this, listening to this, check them out. Neil, I really appreciate you coming back on the show. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And you've done a great job today of just putting things in perspective here from the bank failures and how that's going to have an effect on commercial real estate, the liquidity crisis, all the way through AI being the most incredible invention ever by man. Really love talking with you. Thanks so much for having this conversation today. Sounds good. Incredible and terrifying. (laughs) <laughs> Don't forget the terrifying part. That's a whole different webinar. I'm sure you'll do a webinar on that at some point, huh? I'm preparing one right now. Thank you, Brian. 